I'm Jim Kircher, and Living St. Louis continues its summer of the 20th century from our archives, an episode from decades that takes us back to St. Louis in the 1910s. Seems like a long time ago. I mean, all those people are long gone. But the issues? Well, that's another story. Tonight on Decades, international tensions, women's rights, family values, racial divisions, and sex and violence in the media. And the year is 1910. Decades was a co-production of the Missouri History Museum and the Nine Network of Public Media. When you look at the 20th century timeline for St. Louis, you have a World's Fair, a World War, the Roaring Twenties. But we knew when we were doing this series as we approached the year 2000, we needed to look behind and between those big events. I mean, how did we go from the corseted lady with a parasol to the flapper with a cigarette? So when you look at the teens, you do find a time of change and not surprisingly, a time of conflict and uncertainty. In the summer of 1914, the Great War started in Europe. There were a lot of people in St. Louis with their roots, even their families over there and they had been following the developments closely for years, especially in the local German press. But for other St. Louisans, the war was a headline about issues they didn't understand and places they didn't care about. It just wasn't America's business. And there were plenty of things happening right here at home. St. Louis had a new mayor, Henry Keel, who would serve three terms and leave a lasting mark on the city. There had been a long controversy over building a new bridge downtown, and in this decade, the Free Bridge, later renamed the MacArthur Bridge, was finally completed. Out west on Lindell Boulevard, there was a brand new cathedral going up under the watchful eye of the Archbishop, John Joseph Glenn. And in the neighborhoods, on the streets, at the lunch counters and kitchen tables, there were the arguments, the debates over prohibition, women's suffrage, the death penalty, over sex education, Bibles in the classroom, the effects of the player piano and phonograph on artistic taste, and indecent fashions. As much as anywhere, St. Louis in the teens was an arena of conflicting ideas. St. Louis is that incredible paradox of some very liberal, free-thinking people, and at the same time is a very conservative uh, movement and a sense of, of uh, uh, what one might tend to call a, you know, a southern-northern split, but not always. That's, that's oversimplifying it. So there's a lot of strong currents, a lot of strong feelings going on in St. Louis. A lot of the changes, a lot of issues, were coming from the urban working class. There was a new popular culture, music, dress, language, behavior, and it was spreading from the crowded neighborhoods of the inner city. Every year, every day, new people were being added and were bringing new things. The Sots family came from a small town in Russia for Jews an increasingly dangerous place to stay. And as in a lot of immigrant families, Ben Sots's father came over first. So when my dad came here, he immediately went to work. It was easy to get work. Of course, it was labor work. And then he saved up enough money that he could send for his two oldest daughters. And, uh, and so they came here in 1908. They worked in the, in the dress factories, you know, right immediately they got work, you know. And they weren't earning much, but uh, whatever they paid, they, uh, they you know, they, it went uh, far. Ben, his brothers, and their mother came later. Ben went to school, and like a lot of boys his age, went out and sold papers. These weren't two-income families. These were three, four, and five-income families. The crowded neighborhood young Ben came to was a mix of cultures and languages. My sisters 
when we when we came in into the house, they says, now we have to go and Americanize you and uh, buy you different clothes and do this and do that, start you in school and and uh, we were definitely uh, going to be American citizens, don't you see? And uh, that's the way it was. Ben was soon playing baseball with help from the city of St. Louis. The progressive reformers had built ball fields and organized leagues. In 1914, a huge new pool was built at Fairgrounds Park. The St. Louis Republic newspaper said it continued the moral renovation of the city and would make bad citizens good and good citizens better. St. Louis Park's officials were doing what they could to compete with the temptations of the back alleys, the saloons, and the dance halls. The Parks Department's crowning achievement was an event designed to bring together the whole city. The pageant and mask, staged in Forest Park in 1914 to mark the 150th anniversary of the city's founding. Parks official Charlotte Rumbold, who had earlier helped build inner city bathhouses and playgrounds, was now one of the driving forces behind the pageant and mask. The city that plays together will work together. And the idea behind that was very self-conscious. If we get people to come together and work on a project like a big four-day event uh, and form committees and get costumes and do all the organization that's involved in that to celebrate our city, then we will work together on other uh, more serious problems in the city. And, and she believed that very strongly. Art Hill became an outdoor theater with a huge stage constructed in the lake. In an epic production, a cast of thousands presented the history of St. Louis from the mound builders on. Over four days, 400,000 people came to watch. There hadn't been such a gathering in Forest Park since the World's Fair 10 years before. In the years after the fair, Forest Park underwent a major transformation. It was supposed to take a year, but took nearly a decade. The end result was very much the work and the vision of the new Parks Commissioner, Dwight Davis. He opened up the park to the people, a public golf course and tennis facilities, but in a landscape setting still beautiful to walk through. Davis didn't want a zoo in the park, but Mayor Keel did, and it was built up around the World's Fair birdcage, with pennies from school children helping to buy an elephant named Miss Jim in 1916. Three years later, the Municipal Opera became a permanent fixture, and the modern version of Forest Park was complete. It was what the reformers like Davis and Charlotte Rumbold believed it should be, a place where all St. Louisans could play together. But Charlotte Rumbold wasn't around to enjoy it. After the pageant and mask, she went to City Hall to get a raise, but opponents on the Board of Aldermen cited her gender and her politics and turned her down. Women's groups rose in support, but what women still could not do was vote anybody out of office. The aldermen held their ground, so did Charlotte Rumble. She resigned in 1915 and went to work for more money in the city of Cleveland, Ohio. After all, I am not sorry to have had the issue made on the fact that I am a woman. It is a splendid thing to be a woman in these days when we have to go to the trenches for our citizenship our equal pay for equal work. I rather like it. two big reasons for strong local opposition to outlawing alcohol. The beer business was a major part of the local economy. And then there was simply the fact that a lot of people, especially those of European background, liked to drink. In St. Louis, that meant Irish, Poles, Italians, and of course, the Germans, whose beer gardens were centers of social and family life. Part of German life was not only drinking, that is drinking beer and wine in moderation, but also doing it in a public context. And uh, also this goes together with the whole problem of the Sabbath. Uh, uh, Germans of all religions, and no religion at all, believed that Sunday was to be spent 
uh, enjoying oneself. And uh, uh, American Sabbath legislation attempted to impose a sort of uh, very severe uh, Sabbath on these people. The breweries had their public relations campaigns touting the health advantages of their whole grain products, calling for moderation in drinking, and supporting the right of citizens to keep the government out of their personal lives. But prohibitionists were pushing family values, and there were families destroyed by drink. There were fathers and husbands who were drinking up the family's food budget in the local saloon. A lot of people figured that prohibition might pass if women could vote. That was one of the reasons why um, the brewery industry was not in favor of suffrage, uh, because the women had sold the argument, and it's one of the ways they convinced a lot of people to vote for suffrage, was that women would make the world a better place. If you give women the vote, uh, they, will, they are concerned with these issues of home and family and values, and so we will have a better world. And that's really how the suffragists sold the suffrage movement to people in the early 20th century. There were passionate arguments about women voting on both sides. Biblical passages were quoted, there were dire warnings, there were glowing promises. And in the middle of it all, there were a lot of regular folks who just weren't sure. Laura Marsalek was approaching voting age that decade. Politics, I don't remember much about the politics. No, they were here and they were here. People that I was with, they, uh, the women weren't anxious to vote. They really weren't. And said, that's Papa's affair. But the suffrage movement was drawing more and more from the mainstream, from all classes. They liked to call themselves suffragists rather than suffragettes, a term that carried an image of unladylike rabble-rousers. In 1916, the Democratic National Convention was held in St. Louis, and the street to the convention hall was lined with thousands of women in white with parasols and yellow sashes. And as the delegates filed in, the women demanded the right to vote in total silence. At the end of the decade, the hopes and fears were realized. Constitutional amendments outlawed alcohol and gave women the right to vote. St. Louis's Equal Suffrage League turned into the League of Women Voters, and smart politicians like Henry Keel were right by their side. Yes, when it went, when it went and I could vote, I voted. I, I, I try everything. <laughs> it seemed like a lot of women in the teens thought they'd try everything. And E.G. Lewis liked what he saw from his office in University City, the headquarters for his women's magazine, a national organization, and a mail-order college. Lewis was a shrewd operator of various ventures and schemes in his life, and he knew that women, even without the vote, had power, economic power, and a growing sense of independence. Lewis jumped on that bandwagon. Others were trying to put on the brakes. Edward Schneiderhahn was an attorney prominent in the Catholic Church and local politics, and for him it seemed that too many of the old rules of decency and propriety were being broken. He launched a crusade to protect the public against the dangers of a powerful new technology. Films which parade nakedness, films which parade prolonged ravishment struggles, I must speak plainly. Films which present scenes of indecent dances and show the inside workings and operation of dens of vice and crime. He was particularly concerned um, that movies, in a sense, would corrupt middle-class youth. That young men and young women who never would go to a saloon, in his mind, would never frequent a house of prostitution would, just simply by going to the movies, see these things and see images they never would be exposed to in their own neighborhoods and in their own kind of middle-class world. The movie theater, you have to understand, is emerging from work, immigrant working-class culture. Moving pictures had started out as novelties shown in shabby storefront nickel theaters. By the mid-teens, they had grown in sophistication and popularity. Even Washington University students were experimenting with this new medium. This is a 1916 student film, a short romantic comedy entitled The Maid of Macmillan, which makes a good-natured reference to an issue that Schneiderhahn took very seriously. 
Schneiderhan spearheaded an effort to set up a city censorship board, which would clear all films before they could be shown. This was a national debate, but in this issue, as in others, St. Louis showed both sides of its split personality. The St. Louis stands out primarily, I think, because of the amazing opposition to movie censorship. Again, uh, free-thinking socialists who had their own um, publication, The Melting Pot, and trade union leaders were adamantly opposed to the movie censorship campaign. And they were opposed to this campaign because they saw it specifically as a real attack against working class culture and working class life. The censorship law never passed, but there was enough pressure to get some films withdrawn and scenes cut out before most St. Louisans could see them. In the 1920s, the movie industry, facing the threat of government intervention, began its own strict censorship of films through the Hayes office. There is no doubt that the movie industry up to the present day has developed almost entirely into an industry to furnish entertainment, yet it is the only cultural influence for millions of persons. The trouble is that the average motion picture acts on a plane entirely too low. I am stating the simple facts. In 1917, a five-year-old boy named Jefferson Lewis got on board a northbound train with his family and became part of the greatest migration of African Americans since the end of the Civil War. I was born in Marine, Mississippi. And uh, my mother and them and all the people in the South was calling St. Louis God country. Southern blacks needed jobs, northern factories needed workers. Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland. But St. Louis wasn't quite all the way north. And yet while the schools here were legally segregated, there were schools for everybody. Sumner High School had been built for black students back in 1875. From the Civil War onward, Sumner High School is a major attraction for migrants wanting to provide educational opportunities for their children. So it could, while it could be considered upper south, it did not have as oppressive forces going on here as you found in the deep south. Although African Americans had always been part of the St. Louis population, Never had they been so numerous and so visible. You go from not having a race problem to all of a sudden having a race problem. And of course, in reality, it was not all of a sudden. It had always been there. The migration prompted an effort to help out the new arrivals. A group of black and white social workers formed what they called the St. Louis Committee for Social Services Among Colored People. And this organization is the precursor to the Urban League in St. Louis. They state that they want to perform their work quietly, without fanfare, okay? Uh, they feel the need for this, but there is a strong sense that the city wide is not yet ready to deal with the racial issue as a whole. But one idea was put to a citywide vote in 1916. Neighborhood associations and realtors advocated imposing a system of mandatory residential segregation on a block-by-block -block basis throughout the city. Although the Supreme Court would rule such laws unconstitutional, St. Louis voters approved the measure by a landslide. The idea of citizens voting directly on such issues had come from the reformers but they had never intended this new power to be used to divide the city. The disillusioning part about it is that they weren't sufficiently um, sophisticated in understanding that people uh, will vote their racial prejudices, they will vote what they see or their economic self-interest. It isn't simply, it isn't as simple as, as some of the progressives I think thought it was. It's not that easy to change the way 
society operates. The low point in race relations came in 1917 across the river. The influx of black workers was changing things in these company-dominated towns, changing politics and the job market. Many union organizers didn't want the new workers, and the companies could take them on and let them go as needed. What you had going on in East St. Louis in the 1910s was a strategy to manipulate black labor for purposes of preventing unions. And when white union workers would leave the jobs, they were being replaced by non-union black workers who were brought up from the South. That's what happened during a strike at the Aluminum Ore Company that year, and the growing labor and racial tension exploded on the night of July 2nd. White mobs, touched off by the shooting of a policeman and by exaggerated rumors, killed and burned their way through a black neighborhood. It was that very night Jefferson Lewis's family arrived from the South. Where we were standing, we could see different people running and hollering, colored people. And they were getting down in the weeds that they were hiding from. The, and the guy would run and shoot. You didn't know what to shoot. You just see the smoke and hear the shot. The official death toll was nearly 50, eight whites, 39 blacks. There may have been more. The National Guard troops were brought in, but they and the local police had been unable and at times unwilling to prevent the violence. It was big news around the country, troops fighting for democracy in Europe, troops in the heartland trying to keep Americans from killing each other. Some theorized, perhaps they hoped, that it was German spies who had stirred up all the trouble. The United States had entered Europe's war in April of 1917. One of the country's biggest induction centers for volunteers and draftees was at Jefferson Barracks. There was mobilization on the home front, industries gearing up for the war, rationing, and a drive to support the war through the sale of Liberty Bonds. And there were those who felt that if you couldn't fight the Germans in Europe, you could be anti-German right here at home. In Collinsville, Illinois, a mob lynched a German worker. They had heard he had made remarks against President Wilson. But even things that didn't have anything to do with politics came under attack. Schools stopped teaching German. Streets with names like Berlin and Bismarck got new names. There were moves to ban German books and newspapers, even the playing of Bach and Beethoven. The war, in effect, licensed a lot of hostilities that otherwise would not have been permitted. And it also was an insult, of course, to these people because they felt themselves to be highly patriotic. And in, if anything, they felt themselves more patriotic than, their, uh, than the people who lived next to them. Many German Americans, Southside butchers and millionaire brewers alike, were visible and vocal in their loyalty and their support of the American war effort. But by the end of the decade, what had once been a proud, prominent, and colorful part of St. Louis's identity and image had in many ways been wiped away from view. It was much more now a place of Americans for Americans, no hyphens allowed. 1,075 St. Louisans had given their lives by the time the war in Europe came to an end in November 1918. Americans had helped win the war that they knew, but they had also helped change the world more than they could begin to realize. And some of those changes were already getting back home to St. Louis even before the soldiers did. Waiting for them back home were many women who had fought their wartime battles in the factories and in the Liberty Bond campaign. And when suffrage came up for a vote, few politicians were willing to stand up to say that women did not deserve or could not handle the right to vote. And there were the Civil War veterans in St. Louis, both Union and Confederate, now in their 70s and 80s. Which side they had fought on just didn't seem to matter as much anymore. It's really with World War I that, that the nation becomes uh, unified North and South on a single cause. Uh, that patriotism clearly excludes some people. Uh, in the aftermath of World War I, we have immigration restriction. We have an intensification of the segregation of the races. Uh, we have uh, a lot of things that, uh, that we often forget about. 
The spring of 1919 was a season of parades in St. Louis. When they had marched off to war, they had left a place still firmly tied to the 19th century, but so many of the old ties had finally snapped, and the 20th century had broken free and was shifting into high gear. They had been the children of the World's Fair. They would be the young men and women of the Roaring Twenties. They would raise their children in the Depression, and they would send those children off to war. It's easy to dismiss some of the people of the teens as hopeless fuddy-duddies stuck back in the 19th century. But even some of the modern thinkers of the day had trouble keeping up with things. In many ways, what we think of as the 20th century was just about to begin. For decades, I'm Jim Kircher.